Have you or someone you know been called to jury duty in Judge Kimbler's court? If so, go to www.czclip.org and click on the judge's picture to get juror training. Once you're there, the judge will give you all you need to know to be a competent juror in his courtroom. It's to give you an overview of what we expect from you if you're chosen as a juror. It's free and it's easy. Just register and watch the video. This message is proudly sponsored by the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, Inc., a not-for-profit Ohio corporation devoted to legal education. Hello and welcome to Law Talk. My name is John Celebrezzi and I'm the co-founder of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, as we call it CZ CLEP for short. Our organization provides continuing education about the judiciary and legislature to attorneys, judges, government officials, and the general public. As a career ed educator, I recognize early on how important legal matters are and, and how they impact our lives. I am the nephew of the late Anthony J. Celebrezzi, who was the popular five-term mayor of Cleveland and a member of President Kennedy's cabinets. As a tribute to his lifetime commitment to the legal process, we dedicate this show. Welcome to Ask the Judge, a program presented by the CC Court Reporter, a function of CZ CLEP. John's guest today is Medina County Common Pleas Judge James Kimbler. Judge Kimbler is Medina County's longest serving judge, taking office in 1986 as the judge of the Wadsworth Municipal Court. In 1996, the judge was elected to his current position as Common Pleas Judge. Today's show will give the judge and some Medina County citizens an opportunity to explore questions about the law that are often on our minds. Welcome. I. I would like to start out today pointing out to my viewers that last time you were here, it's been a little <coughs> while ago, you were celebrating your 25th year on the bench. Is that right? That's right. And that's been a couple of years ago. Yeah, I now have uh, February 10th of uh, 2013 was my uh, 27th year on the bench. Uh, the last year has probably been pretty uh, dramatic in one sense because uh, the last from March of 2012 until March of 2013, I, had, I presided over the largest uh, verdict in civil trial, which was a medical malpractice yeah. case. And I presided over the uh, death, a death penalty case, which was the first death penalty case in about 60 or 70 years in Medina County. So it's been a pretty dramatic year uh, in one sense, um, but it's been an interesting year. Yeah. Well, I guess, We'll see how you do in the second 25, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to lead the bench when I'm 70 or so. Oh, so. we got a long time for that. <laughs> well, we asked you here today because we heard and uh, uh, we know that you oftentimes come up with some innovative court programs and it's our understanding that you have a new one called, it has to do with the conduct of your jurors, is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, and we're going to talk about it today. Uh, I understand that uh, we have some questions. Yeah, actually we do. Uh, Kate Feeks, our CZ reporter, has been out and about as she normally is. Hi, Kate. Hi. Good morning, Kate. Good morning. And she's actually found several of your constituents, sort of people on the street, who have some questions uh, about the new program, the new juror conduct program, and we wondered if you'd be so kind to answer them today. Sure, be okay. glad to look forward to it. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Kate, and Kate, take it away. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Judge Kimbler, thank you for joining us. And the first question I have for you today is from Jim, and he would like to know... Hello, Judge Kimbler. My name is Jim. Why did you produce the juror conduct video? You know, a lot of people appear for jury duty. Have, most people have never appeared for jury, jury duty at all. They have no idea what to expect. They have no idea what's going to happen to them when they come to the court. But a lot of times they're hesitant to uh, address questions to my staff because, number one, they don't want to interfere with people, um, 
doing their work. Uh, number two, they don't want to act like they don't know what's going to happen. Uh, number three, I think they're, they're not sure how this is going to be received. So what we were hoping to do was to uh, do a uh, video um, clip, so to speak, of what, we, what I expect from jurors, both in terms of their conduct and also in terms of what's going to happen to them when they come to the court, uh, what's going to be the, uh, the uh, schedule of events, so to speak. And what we're hoping to do is to decrease uh, potential jurors' anxiety so that when they come to court, they are, they are focused from the, the very start about uh, their role in the uh, criminal and civil justice system. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very helpful. Okay, next is Tom. Hello, Judge Kimmler. My name is Tom from Medina. I was wondering where I would go to see the video if I were a prospective juror. They have to go to the ZZ, uh, Celebrezi Zangi Community Legal Education uh, Project website. That is Z, www.czclep.org. And if they look on that website, I believe on the uh, left hand side of their screen, they'll see uh, a, a picture of myself and also the words, I believe, juror conduct. They clip on that, they click on that, and then uh, there's a password. They have to give a username and a password, uh, and then they, they view the uh, film. Uh, at that point. So right now we're doing it through the Celebrezi Zangi Community Education Project, which is a uh, for non-profit Ohio corporation. Okay, if I could jump in here for a minute. Judge, what we'll do to help our viewers out on this, we'll actually show our website okay. address here uh, because that's, that's the, the gate here to get to this. So we'll put this on so prospective jurors watching the show can do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Kate. Okay, next I have Bill. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Bill. Now, I'd like to know what are a couple of different challenges that attorneys use to remove prospective jurors? Uh, there's what, when people are called into the uh, courtroom for jury service, let's say we need uh, eight or uh, people on the, for a civil trial, or we need 12 people for a criminal trial. Uh, I think sometimes people are kind of um, surprised to see that instead of having you know 12 people there, we have like 35 people there or 40 people there. And the reason is, uh, first of all, because we may run more than one jury trial in a week, and so we try to have we try to spread around the uh, duty, so to speak. But the second thing is, when jurors appear for jury duty, um, even though they've been selected, um, that is not the end of the process. The attorneys are allowed to challenge uh, the juror under two types of challenge. One is known as a challenge for cause, and the other is known as a peremptory challenge. Now, a challenge for cause, uh, each side has an unlimited number of challenges for cause, but they're for pretty narrow reasons. An example of a challenge for cause might be, let's say we had a person on the jury who was going through a divorce, and one of the attorneys was representing that person in the divorce. Well, that'd be a challenge for cause. Or if we had a person on the jury who um, is, has a, is a relative of somebody who's appearing in the lawsuit as a party, that'd be a challenge for cause. But they're pretty narrow reasons. But the second kind of challenge is what's known as a peremptory challenge. And that's a challenge an attorney can exercise for virtually any reason, and they don't have to give a reason to the juror uh, and to the court. However, there's only four of those in a criminal case and three of those in a civil case per side. So let's say we start out with 12 people. There's a couple of challenges for cause. Each side exercises four peremptory challenges. Well, the first 12 we had, 10 of them would be gone. It would have 10 new people taking their place when we actually started the trial. So because of that, we usually have to keep around 25 to 30 for a criminal case and around 15 to 20 uh, for a civil case. Also, quite frankly, uh, although most people do appear in our summons, sometimes people are uh, inavoidably uh, delayed or uh, have to delay their jury service or their uh, commitment to us. And so that's why we have to have more than the number of people we're gonna actually going to need when the trial uh, begins. Okay. Judge, I want to ask you a question about that. I've, I've often wondered this on the uh, peremptory challenge. You could, uh, the attorney could actually take off in anybody. I mean, there is one potential um, uh, uh, check on the peremptory challenge, and that is they can. the Supreme Court of the United States has said that they cannot exercise a peremptory challenge in a way that is racially exclusive. And I'll I give see. an example of this. 
um, during the murder case we recently we we did recently we had one African American person on the jury. She was the only African American person on the whole jury panel. So we had potentially we had maybe two or three hundred people call for jury duty potentially that week to be interviewed, but she was the only one who was uh, of a different race than the rest of us. And so uh, a challenge of her, if there was a peremptory challenge of her, then the court, then if the other party objected to that, then the, the, the person doing the challenge would have to give to me a uh, reason why they're I exercising see. that I challenge. See. So for example, Let's suppose you had a person who was a member of the African American race or the or was an Asian uh, race, and they're on our jury panel. And there's a they, it, it turns out that they are um, uh, a spouse of a police officer. I see. Okay, and the prosecutor goes to peremptory challenge them, and the defense says, "Why are you doing this?" You know. Or no, well, in that case, be the way around. Let's say the defense goes to peremptory challenge and the prosecutor objects. Sure. They would come to court, and so the prosecutor would say something like, "Judge, we're challenging," or the defense would say, "Judge, we're challenging this person because they're a police officer's spouse, and we think they're going to be biased to the state." I see. In that case, I'd probably allow the challenge because that's a rational, non-racial reason why you would exclude somebody from jury service if you were an attorney for uh, the defendant. Um, but I, I, those are called Batson challenges after the name of the case in the United States Supreme Court. I've only had. Uh, twice where there's been a Batson challenge. Uh, one time was for gender and the other time was for race. The one that was for gender, I found that the attorney had a valid reason to make the challenge and so I did not um, stop the challenge or prohibit the challenge. And the one that was for race, the attorney was not able to articulate a valid reason uh, and there, therefore I did not I allow that challenge to take place. Okay. So that, the, the Batson case is probably the only restriction on, the peremptory. on peremptory challenges in Ohio and the Batson decision was the United States Supreme Court case, it was not an Ohio Supreme sure, Court. Sure, so it's going to rule. Yeah. Well, we wondered about that, it's, it's very interesting. Kate, I'm sorry, I just wanted to <laughs> That's okay. seize the opportunity. <laughs> okay, sure, next. Sure, uh, you well, well, <laughs> <laughs> next is Sherry. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Sherry Patterson. My question is, what evidence does the jury see? Evidence can be uh, one, probably of two forms. There can be what's called um, testimony, which is when a person comes in and testifies under oath. That can be done uh, in, in live. In certain civil cases, it can also be done by video. Um, the second th form of evidence <coughs> is called exhibits, which are physical uh, things such as maps, diagrams, pictures, bills, uh, virtually anything you can bring into a courtroom can be an exhibit. Um, and then there is what's called circumstantial evidence, and there's what's called direct evidence. And direct evidence is when somebody testifies to something that they have experienced directly. Circumstantial evidence is when we're given direct evidence which we can infer something else happened. Um, the classical example sometimes used by lawyers is the last prospective jurors. Have you ever gone into, heard a crash in your house? You go into a room, there's a lamp on the floor, and you're, both your kids are denying that they did anything. Well, you know something was done because you heard the crash. You know the lamp's on the floor because of the activity of the children. So the fact that you, even though you didn't see the lamp crash, so to speak, you heard the crash, you observed the result, that's circumstantial evidence. And in Ohio, um, a lot of jurors, there used to be the idea that jurors thought or people thought that you couldn't base a criminal conviction solely on circumstantial evidence. That is not true. Uh, circumstantial evidence is um, every bit as valid as, as direct evidence. And indeed, there are certain lawyers who try cases who would argue that circumstantial evidence is more reliable because usually the person giving you the direct evidence from which you're making the inference really has no motivation to mm -hmm. either lie or to misrepresent the evidence because they don't know that it's going to be used to make an inference, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay, next is Jay. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Jay Goodman from Medina. My question for you is, describe the job of the jury as compared to your job. Well, we have this kind of uh, division of labor in a, in a court trial, or in a jury trial rather. Uh, the jury decides the issues of fact, and I decide the issues of law and procedure. So um, the best way I can, I can think of it is, 
Uh, when we try a jury trial, I have the umpire role. That is, I have to make sure the evidence that the jury receives is based on the law in Ohio. I have to uh, make sure the lawyers uh, obey um, their uh, procedural rules. Uh, I have to keep the trial going um, smoothly. But it is not my job to decide issues of fact. So what does that mean? Well, let's say we had a case, for example, where um, there is a stop, there's a collision at an intersection and both parties are saying that I had the stop sign, okay, or I had, the, I had the green light. Both parties say I had the green light. We know one of the parties did not have the green light because the crash took place. Um, it's the jury's job to decide whether or not, um, or is decide which party wins the case by deciding which party had the green light, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not my job to decide that. So, for example, if somebody wants to introduce evidence of how the light functions, and there's an objection to that evidence, then my ruling would determine whether or not the jury hears that evidence. But as far as determining the issue of who had the green light, that is a factual issue, and that's determined by the jury. So it's kind of this division of labor between, jur between juries and judges. And indeed, one of the things we, we instruct the jury at the end of the trial is I will tell the jury, if you think that I have indicated to you as a judge what the what the, the facts should be, you got to disregard that because that's your role, not my role. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we have to be very careful as judges when we try cases uh, not to intrude upon the role of the jury and not indicate how we think a factual issue should be decided. Okay. okay. Good answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it really was. Next Thank is you. Zach. Hi, Judge Kibler. My name is Zach, and my question for you is. Are jurors permitted to use the internet to do their own research? No, they are, and I, I'm pretty emphatic about that because I once had the experience, um, and I, I once had a six-day malpractice case that was in its last day, and a juror came into the jury room that morning and announced to the entire jury panel that this lawyer had been sued six times. Hmm. And how she had gotten that, she had gone on the internet and she had done research to find out that yes, there had been six lawsuits filed in our court against the same doctor. However, what she didn't realize was all six times that doctor was sued, he won the case. Mm -hmm. So that really gave a misunderstanding to the uh, jury as to what was going on. So at that point, I had to bring the attorneys in and say, look, you know, this is what's happened, what do you want me to do? And the defense lawyer moved for a mistrial and I had to grant it, which means we had to scrap that trial and start over. Uh, and the lawyers had spent, on behalf of their clients, around $50,000 in extra witness fees. Wow. Wow. Now that, that juror became really upset when she realized I was gonna have to dismiss the case. She became almost hysterical because, frankly, she thought I was about to hold her in jail for contempt or I was mm -hmm. about to take some action against her. Well, um, I'm not sure I would have done that in any event. However, as it turns out, I had not told the jury not to do their own research on the internet. And I so see. I did not think it was appropriate for me to take any action against her, nor could I have. But the reason why we don't want jurors doing their own research, and not just the internet, we don't want them going to accident scenes, we don't want them um, uh, calling witnesses on their own is because they have to base their verdict only on what they receive in the courtroom in terms of the evidence that's presented. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, as I said about the lady who came in and told about the six prior lawsuits, she didn't know the whole story. You know, she left the impression that this person, this doctor, had committed malpractice six times. Right. Well, there had been six allegations of malpractice, but never a proven claim of malpractice. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you don't want jurors doing their own research. So um, I often tell, I tell jurors now they can't do their own research on the internet. And uh, unlike the previous case, I have uh, warned them. And if I had to mistry a case because of that, um, I could probably take some action against them. Okay. So, if I could jump in for a minute here, Judge, uh, this is our, our society changing. When you became a judge, I guess there oh, was, yeah, there wasn't was, an internet. Oh, there wasn't right. an internet. There was not. Well, there was an internet, but no one used it. There was not social media. There was not. Uh, I, uh, there was not cell phones that carried uh, um, uh, picture taking sure, capability. Sure. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues had a case in uh, Cleveland, Ohio that was pretty uh, scary because 
she had um, a member of a gang that was being tried and people came in who were also gang members started taking pictures of the jury using oh, their cell wow. phones. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And when she realized that she had to, first of all, she had to mistry the case. She kicked that jury out. Luckily the jury hadn't been sworn yet so there was no double jeopardy issues. She kicked that jury out and then she put a standard rule on that you cannot have a cell phone in her courtroom and if you have a cell phone she'll take it from you. Okay. Um, so you know, the, the technology uh, mm -hmm. issues uh, present challenges yeah, that you don't think of, you know, over when I started being a judge 27 sure. years ago. Well, I noticed, uh, the I guess the reason I asked you a question, I did view your clip, of course, right. and I see, you know, in your video where you're talking to prospective jurors, you made that abundantly clear. Uh, I mean, that's that you will not be doing your own internet, which, which is, now we understand. I mean, we, yeah. we, we didn't maybe before, but now we fully understand. Uh, mistrial could easily happen that way, plus the safety of people involved. Mm -hmm. Kate? Okay, next is Carolyn. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name is Carolyn. What is the no-talk rule as it applies to jurors? While the trial is in progress, juries cannot discuss the case that they are uh, hearing with anybody. Now, the first part of the rule <laughs> is easier for juries to understand. They can't discuss their, their family. They, can, they can't discuss with their co-workers. They can't discuss with their friends. Why? because we don't want people coming to conclusions until they've heard everything, okay? So, uh, and we don't want somebody who inadvertently hears, mentions something to a potential juror and, and causes a bias in that person's mind. Um, so, it's easy enough for jurors to understand that. The second part of the no-talk rule is pretty easy to understand. While the trial's in progress, juries cannot talk to the lawyers or witnesses on their own or um, members uh, of the lawsuit, you know, parties to the lawsuit. Um, and as I often tell juries, I said, look, no matter how innocuous your conversation is with the attorneys, it may not look good to the other side. They may wonder what's going on. Uh, and what lawyer, what jurors can do unintentionally is that they start speaking to jurors that put or lawyers that puts the lawyers in a bind because mm -hmm. they don't want to be rude to the jury, but they don't want to look like they're doing something wrong. The third part of the no talk rule is probably a little bit more difficult for jurors to understand, and that is while the trial is in progress, they may not discuss the case among themselves, and they may not talk about the case until they actually go back to start their jury deliberations. And the reason why we don't want them to talk about the case among themselves is that we're worried that people will start coming to conclusions and they'll get an emotional investment in their opinion and they won't be willing to change their opinion later on even if they think it could be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we have the no talk rule. That third part of the no talk rule is the one part that has been criticized by some commentators and judges. Uh, there are some commentators and judges who believe it would actually increase the jury's understanding if they could talk about the trial while the trial's in progress. Uh, but that kind of rule change would have to come from the Ohio Supreme Court. It could not unilaterally be imposed by myself. <laughs> okay, well, Kate, go ahead. <laughs> okay, next is Julie. Hi, Judge Kimbler. My name's Julie, and my question for you is, what are some of the reasons you might excuse a juror? Vacation plans, uh, medical uh, treatment, um, sick spouse, sick child, um, uh, work sometimes but not all the time. Uh, in the murder case I had, I had a juror who, who turned out to be, I think, a very good juror. And her employer sent us a letter asking that we excuse her. And we, we were talking to her privately because we voir dired, we selected the jury in, in private. And I said, look, is this coming from you or is this coming from your boss? Mm -hmm. And she said, it's really coming from my boss. It's not coming from me. And at that point, I said, okay, I'm not going to excuse her because she was indicating to me, I believed, that she was comfortable proceeding, but her boss wanted her to make the request. Um, so sometimes for employment um, and sometimes for financial reasons. I had a juror one time who had been out of work for about a year. Uh, it was, it was a uh, woman who had worked for a bank that had, that had been sold out and mm -hmm. she had lost her job. It took a year to find a new job. And she said that her family had gotten behind on some bills and she really needed to be at work and she just started this new job. So we let her go. Um, but those are the kind of reasons we let a person go from jury duty. Okay. And what we use, sometimes we try to do is reschedule them. Like let's yeah. say a person tells us, I'm going to be on vacation next week. We'll say, okay, you know what? We'll reschedule you for later in the year. I see. Okay. Kate, I see the clock's 
moving right along. Mm -hmm. That's um, all I have. So thank you so much, and thank you to the folks who provided the judge these questions. Judge, I had a law professor once that said the the American the system of jurisprudence, the American jury, I think is what he was trying to say, is the envy of the free world. And he and maybe I, I think I take it you would probably agree with that guy because you have always seemed to be really interested in jurors, right? Yeah, I I, I like to watch jurors do their job. I think jurors take their job very seriously. I once had a lawyer tell a jury in my courtroom that the, the jury is the last barrier between an unjust accusation and a person. You know. So that's a segue. Do you have any new ones, uh, new ideas coming down the pike that you'll maybe give us a hint about? We would like to set up uh, what we're calling a uh, court ambassador program or a juror ambassador program whereby we would have people who are volunteers who've been on jury duty who'll be around to field questions from prospective okay. jurors. And the reason why I think this might work better would be that uh, they might these people might be a lot more comfortable talking to a person Big who, point. like themselves, has gone sure. through the system rather than a court official. So uh, we hope to be rolling that out in the next year or so. So when that happens, do you think we could have you back to talk about that? I always like to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Judge. Thank you, John. Thank you, Judge thank Kimberly. You, Kate. Comments made by John's guest on Law Talk are solely those of his guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. To view this show and others, go to www.cdzclub.org. In the Wandsworth area, a complete listing of dates and times of this broadcast, tune in to WCTV Channel 15 or log on to wandsworthcity.com and follow the links to WCTV. At CZ Club, we're devoted to the education of today's legal issues. Fueled by the public's keen interest in our legal system and current events, CZ Club is dedicated to the educational venues aimed at enhancing the understanding by all citizens, regardless of age, education, occupation, or wealth. A function of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. Have you or someone you know been called to jury duty in Judge Kimbler's court? If so, go to www.czclub.org and click on the judge's picture to get juror training. Once you're there, the judge will give you all you need to know to be a competent juror in his courtroom. It's to give you an overview of what we expect from you if you're chosen as a juror. It's free and it's easy. Just register and watch the video. This message is proudly sponsored by the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, Inc., a not-for-profit Ohio corporation devoted to legal education.